Hello and welcome to the University of Maryland Extension's Zooming Into Healthy Horse Keeping webinar series for 2020. My name is Jennifer Reynolds. I am the Extension Coordinator for Equine and Poultry Programs at the University of Maryland and I will be assisting as host today. We're excited to have all of you joining us live and also for those of you who may be listening later to this recording. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Amy Burke. She is an associate professor in the Animal and Avian Sciences Department, and she coordinates the Equine Studies Program at the University of Maryland. She teaches our courses in horse management, equine science, and equine reproduction there. Her area of expertise um, include horse nutrition and pasture management. She is the current chairman of the National Association of Equine Affiliated Academics and a board member of the Equine Science Society and the Maryland Horse Industry Board locally here. Her graduate work was completed in equine nutrition as a Pratt Fellow at Virginia Tech, earning her master's in 1998 and her PhD in 2001. We're very happy to have her with us today. She'll be presenting on the topic of production, productive pastures for happy horses, happy humans, and a healthy environment. Thank you, Jennifer. Hey, everybody, let's see, I'm trying to, I don't know, Jen, can you guys see me? I don't think you can. Yeah, I can see you. Oh, I just can't see me then. Well, anyway, I wanted to check in with everybody and say thank you so much for joining me today. I really love to talk about this topic because I think it's a win-win-win. I think if you have productive pastures, you can have healthier horses, and also you can trim your wallet a little bit, I guess, to reduce costs by using pasture as a nutritional source. And the other benefit or the other win really is a happy, healthy environment. And that's, um, that's really great too. So I'm gonna just go ahead and stop my video now that you guys have seen me a little bit here and get on with the, the discussion. So I have a couple of objectives to my presentation today. I really was hoping to be able to make more people aware of the benefits of pasturing horses. You know, certainly getting horses out on pasture is great for exercise and normal behavior, but there's a lot of nutritional benefits as well. So we'll talk about that. I, I hope to have everybody understand how unmanaged horses or unmanaged grazing horses specifically can negatively impact the environment. And then I'm gonna spend most of the time today really focused on best management practices for productive horse pastures. And there are a lot of best management practices out there for the entire farm to reduce negative environmental impact. And I'll touch on a few of those, but I really wanted to spend most of my time today on horse pastures specifically. So as far as productive pastures, and I'll, I'll actually define what I consider to be a good productive pasture. Um, but I really find that productive pastures are a good source of nutrition. So if you look over here, this top picture is actually um, some University of Maryland horses out at our rotational grazing site. And you'll see a lot of really productive pasture pictures from that grazing site out in um, Clarksville, Maryland. But pastures can be a fantastic source of nutrition. And, you know, when I was, um, I say growing up, but when I was in college, they don't, my instructors would always tell me that pasture can meet uh, you know, all of the nutritional needs of, of horses at maintenance. But I've spent enough time now managing pastures and analyzing pastures to know that they, they don't provide everything. But one of the things they're really good at providing is a great source of fiber. And all of us need fiber in our diet as far as humans and horses. It keeps the GI tract moving normally, removing food normally, and that's really important. The other thing that pasture up there in that corner picture provides is water. Um, vitamins and minerals, protein, um, carbohydrates, and fats. So it is a great nutritional source. So I'd really love for people to not just look at their pastures as a exercise lab, but also as a nutritional source. The other thing pastures do is they promote good health, right? We know that getting horses out on pasture lowers the incidence of gastric ulcers. It helps reduce the risk of colic. It also helps them to be normal, happy, healthy horses by playing with each other and running and, you know, just normal turnout. Keeps their mouths busy, which is great. You know, they're constantly foraging out on pasture. They're producing saliva and that also helps reduce um, gastric ulcers as far as buffering the stomach acids. Another thing productive pastures do is reduce farm costs. And I think that's a key for any horse farm manager in trying to reduce farm costs. 
So productive pastures are great because you don't have to feed as much hay. Certainly in our area in Maryland, we're in the mid-Atlantic, we do have to feed hay during the warm summer drought periods. We also have to feed hay you know, in the winter when we don't have pasture available and there are other times, you know, in stalls and things like that. But if you can reduce your hay cost, that's really gonna be great for your um, farm budget. The other thing is when horses are out, you're not cleaning stalls. So you can reduce bedding and labor costs by utilizing pasture. So I think that's important to keep in mind. And lastly here, we can definitely reduce soil and nutrient losses into nearby waterways if we can get productive pastures going. So the number one way to anchor soil and keep soil losses from occurring on your farms are using trees or forests. Second to that is pasture. So we love, love, love seeing lots of pasture out in Maryland. So I wanted to show you guys a picture here. Obviously this is grass up here, the crop, and then we have this root system. And that's why it's so, so, so important to keep productive, happy grass plants on your farm because these dense roots will anchor soil in place. If you don't have the plant, water comes along and pulls that soil down into the nearby waterways, pulling in nitrogen and other nutrients that can be really just toxic to that um, aquatic life in that, in that uh, waterway. So we don't want that from happening. We gotta keep the roots healthy and strong and that grass growing. But then we have issues with horses. We love our horses, but they are very large, big bodied, very athletic, selective grazers. So I'm gonna actually start with that notion of a selective grazer. They will, um, you know, really, really, they're really tough on a pasture. So in this picture over here, I like this picture because they're big draft horses. They have a high, you know, intake or they need a lot of food to maintain that body weight. And they're gonna go ahead and, and you can see here, if there's not enough vegetation, they are gonna go ahead and selectively graze that pasture really to the ground. So they first pick what they like, usually clover or maybe an orchard grass. And then they go to the fescues. Maybe they don't like that as much, but they will consume it. And then they'll regraze the, the young vegetative grasses just down to the ground. Well, underneath the soil, the height of the roots are actually affected by that overgrazing and you lose the plant because the roots can't sustain the growth anymore. They just get, you know, they just die off. So horses can damage vegetation just by overgrazing. They can damage vegetation by trampling. You can see in this picture, when you put horses out on really wet pastures, they really just tear it up and kill off the vegetation in that pasture. The other thing that they do is, and this is a little extreme picture because this is a, a stallion um, from when I was in graduate school, but they make bathroom areas. And where they defecate, they don't go back and regrace. So you have these bathroom areas with lots of manure, lots of weeds that encroach in, unmanaged, you know, it's kind of really tall. And then that area becomes an unused area of your pasture. It's really inefficient to have all these bathroom areas. So we're gonna talk about how to manage manure today as well in your pastures to try to reclaim all of your pasture for nutrition and grazing. I'll put up a couple pictures because these are kind of the you know, negative environmental impacts that I see happening from time to time. This farm here, uh, we were called out a group of us because uh, this farm had been putting a lot of horses on a very small acreage and over time they overgrazed the, the plants, the grass. Then because of overgrazing, the soil started to move and it moved downhill and eventually here you can see this is an automatic water that has at least a couple feet of soil erosion around it. Well where did all the soil go? Well in this particular farm's case it went down into a waterway and actually the EPA got called on you know into this to kind of deal with it and they didn't get in trouble they actually got um, great assistance from the county and, and an equine planner that went out there and helped them to reclaim that pasture and also fence off some other pasture and, and just do a better job with management. But you can also see here that looks like some gypsum weed that's toxic to horses. And then this picture is kind of what I see a lot where you have a stream or waterway going through a farm and then they're allowed direct access to that. So they could be potentially defecating in that stream. But what I see here more is that we're feeding hay on the ground 
So that's an organic, you know, source of nutrients and they're defecating in this area. And you can see there's no vegetation. You can even see a little path here. So those nutrients um, from the manure and from the hay and the soil are all going into that local stream and that gets into the watershed. And that's just what we don't want to be doing, right? It's contaminating our local watershed. So we just need to do a better job in that case, fencing out that area to provide a buffer between the stream and the horses is what needed to happen. So I know that you know people watching this live, also those of you who have joined us for the recorded presentation may not live in Maryland, but in Maryland in particular, we have 95, 94% of our state is located in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and we are really working hard in the mid-Atlantic to improve the quality of the Chesapeake Bay. However, it's very tough. I mean, we have a very strong agricultural industry. We have about 20,000 locations that house horses and we cover about 10% of Maryland's land. So we have to be really good environmental stewards, recognizing that we have a lot of locations. The other thing I didn't put on the chart here is that we, um, we compete, I suppose, <laughs> for New Jersey, they like, and Connecticut a little bit for number, um, being number one in the country for horses per square mile. And I say that because I've heard them utilize that too. It depends on your horse numbers, but we're a very small state. We have a lot of horses. We're very horse dense. And so we have to be good stewards because we don't want to, you know, really impact the quality of the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so I keep talking about productive pastures. What do I consider a good quality pasture or productive pasture? First of all, you have to have it big enough to support your horse. If you're really good at managing and you're good at establishment and you keep your grasses, you know, really alive and doing well, you can have one acre per horse. But if you're, you know, you're busy with work, you don't get out to manage your fields a lot, you should probably have a couple acres to support that horse. That gives you a little leeway and, you know, if you can't get out there and mow it or apply fertilizer as often as you'd like. It needs to have good soil fertility. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on soil fertility. Um, we just had a fantastic webinar that you can look up on our YouTube channel about soil. So I would encourage you to look at that. But if you can't feed this, you know, you have to feed the soil. It has to be the right pH, um, have the right nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium levels to really get your plant to grow. And then your plant feeds your horse. We got to pick the appropriate grass and legume species. So we'll talk about that. Um, we don't want to go out to Home Depot and buy turf grasses that are designed for golf courses and homes and then try to grow that for horses. So yes, you know, they're the same species like tall fescue or orchard grass or even white clover, but they've been, they're different in the type of grass that you put down for a horse farm. And then free of toxic trees, plants, and weeds. That in itself is a very uh, large topic and I hope to have a webinar on that coming up soon because I think we could definitely use one. And then adequate fresh clean water and shade for horses at all times and certainly safe fencing. So that's what I would consider a good pasture, but we're going to get into like really the density of the pasture. So another quality that you want to see is good vegetative cover. So I have this picture. This is a typical, you know, horse farm pasture when you look down. Uh, lots of clover, some weeds, a lot of soil. This is not really a pasture that I would consider being a good quality pasture. It's an exercise lot. It might even be called, you know, the fat horse pasture, the pony pasture. When you put them out, you don't really want them to eat a lot. What I consider a good quality pasture is something that looks more like this, right? It's very dense. When you look down, you don't see a lot of soil. So what we've said here is this is 70% vegetative cover. This particular pasture was a tall fescue. Kentucky bluegrass, white clover mix. It doesn't look like there's much clover in this picture, but very little soil. You can see a little bit of soil. This is gonna feed your horses and that grass is gonna anchor soil. And that's what we want to achieve um, when we're managing a horse farm, sort of. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, but there are certain horses, right? Our obese prone horses, our laminate horses that should never go out on a pasture like that. So I do wanna say, fully recognizing that this pasture is not for every horse but if you can you know like we've had thoroughbreds out on our pastures they do very well in a very productive pasture so a little star there asterisk so really we want to maintain greater than 70 percent vegetative cover to have a productive pasture all right so these are the 
seven best management practices that I'm going to be focusing on today, starting with soil fertility. We'll talk about those spored species. Mowing, mowing, mowing is so, so, so important. Controlling weeds, managing manure, maintaining that right stacking density, which I've already touched on, and rotational grazing. So going back to soil fertility, that's where it all starts. If you really want to produce, uh, if you really want to um, improve your pastures, you need to start planting early. And the first thing that you need to do is look at your soil fertility, right? This soil down here is what feeds you plants. And if it's not right, there's no point in going out and buying grass seed and paying someone or having you seed your pastures. It's just a waste of money. So every three years you need to soil test because you know, soil doesn't change that quickly. So sometimes, you know, you need to adjust soil pH and it takes years to get to the point where you want, or you know you're doing everything right and every three years you check in, things are good, but then every once in a while things get out of whack, you need to add a little, you know, more potassium or something. So every three years is, is pretty good. When you send off a soil test, it looks at, or the, the assessments look at the texture, the pH, the nutrient levels, and I'll show you an example of a soil test result. And then it gives you fertilizer and lime recommendations, which I love. I don't like having to look things up. I just want them to tell me what I need to put on my pastures. So what you need to do, and I'm not gonna get too much into it in this presentation because we have these great resources on this, is sample correctly. So on horse pastures, we actually get a soil probe or we take a trowel and dig down six to eight inches to get our samples. We do a random sample of more of the inside of the pasture. So we stay away from fence lines and gates and um, run in sheds and we stick to really the pasture area. And then you need to send it off to a certified lab. So we have plenty of documents online that Jen and I can send you to, to find all that information. But soil test is so important. So, Number one thing it'll tell you really is the pH. And pH is, is really important because weeds love a low pH, but grasses not so much. Grasses that you wanna be growing like a pH about 6.2 to 6.5. If you look out under your fields today, well, actually not today, well, maybe today. I'm trying to think of the growing season. Buttercups are a great example of a low pH typically. So if you have a lot of buttercups, you may want to get your soils tested because you probably have a low pH. So we as love that low pH. The other thing in a soil test is it's going to tell you that nitrogen, uh, sorry, it's going to tell you uh, phosphorus and potassium and some other nutrients, right? It won't tell you nitrogen because that's a very uh, highly movable substance that it's very hard to test for, but they'll give you nitrogen recommendations in your soil test. But you need nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium for normal plant growth and reproduction. If you go out to, you know, a recently seeded pasture and you think to yourself, the grass just looks weak, you know, it just doesn't look good, or it's kind of a light green in appearance, you can kind of see it when you can, you can almost tell really when your pastures need more nutrients or they need a higher pH. And then these um, recommendations that you're going to get on soil tests will uh, tell you how much fertilizer you need on an annual basis, and they will normally recommend two to three applications. So we'll split up, let's say the recommendation is 120 pounds of nitrogen, for instance, a year. You're gonna split that up into maybe two applications. A late winter, early spring, which I like to call green up, and then late August or early September. Now you can split it up into more applications. So, you know, I kept it simple when we were running our rotational grazing site. As soon as it greened up, you know, in April, uh, or may sometimes depending on the year we'd go ahead and apply fertilizer just before rain because when we applied nitrogen we definitely wanted the rain to hit it and bring it into the soil as fast as possible because it is a volatile um, nutrient as far as lime you can apply lime almost any time but we really want it when the grass is growing and taking up nutrients and when the soil isn't frozen so just you know Keep that in mind, you can split up your applications of fertilizer. But I wanted to show you more importantly, like a real life example. So this is a soil test that we sent off last year for our pasture that we have in the middle of campus. Not a lot of people know that, but we have our farm in the middle of the University of Maryland campus and we have a, a nice little small pasture we use for our livestock, including our brood mares that come in. So one of the first things that this test told us up here, you can see is soil pH was 5.9. It was below optimum. I love these graphics. They kind of take the, 
you know, the worry out of everything. They just tell you what's going on. Phosphorus was optimum, potassium was low, magnesium was low. So right away I was like, hmm, North Pasture, our pasture is not doing as well as I had thought. And then they give you the recommendations, which is great. So if we take a look at this first recommendation, they recommended 3,000 pounds per acre of limestone for a target of 6.5. That's going to take us a while. Um, we're not going to put all that down at once and hope that our, line, our pH jumps up, you know. So we have kind of planned out all of these different lime applications over the next couple of years to try to get our pH up where it needs to be. We use a dolomitic lime, which has calcium and magnesium to get our magnesium levels higher. The other thing here is they'll give you a nitrogen recommendation. Well, I think when someone filled out the form, because you have to fill out the soil test form and say, you know, we're, we're growing tall fescue and orchard grass and white clover. Um, someone put that we wanted to have an expected yield at four tons per acre, which is really high. Um, we would be lucky <laughs> if we got that. But they came back with a very high nitrogen recommendation because of that that we put on the form. So 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year and also um, potassium here. So then we had to figure out, okay, we're going to split this up into two or three applications. How much you know, nitrogen and potassium do you have to buy? And we went ahead and, and put the first application on. So that just gives you a kind of an understanding of even us with our attention to detail and passion management, we too, you know, have to apply these different amendments to the soil. I will tell you that I love soil testing because a lot of times it comes back and it says your pH is fine and you don't need any nutrients but nitrogen. And isn't that a fantastic savings compared to, well, you just go to the store and buy everything and put it down, but you don't know if you need it or not. So save your money if you don't need to do it. These tests cost, gosh, I think somewhere in the probably 12 to $20 range now, not, not too costly. Jen, should I go ahead and stop there? I see there might be some questions. I can't see it as I'm talking, but are there any specific questions on soil testing? I don't see any yet. I just shared um, a link to our soil test uh, video and interpreting the soil test results. And awesome. reminder, just let everyone know, I'll make sure that I share the links to some of those resources in the description of the video when we do post it. Okay, thank you so much. So moving on, like let's say you get your soil fertility all straightened out. Now you're ready to either renovate or reseed and you want to pick the right type of grass. Well, there are um, certain species in this particular area that we utilize a lot, cool season grasses in this particular area. You would normally use more warm season grasses, say in the south in Georgia or even in Florida, but up here, our typical gold standards are tall fescue, orchard grass, and Kentucky bluegrass. Now, I love tall fescue um, because it's very hardy. It's pest tolerant and all kinds of great things. However, if you get tall fescue, the old standard K31, it will have an endophyte or a fungus in it that produces toxins that will affect your broodmares. So you never want to use tall fescue that's K31 or that has endophyte. So what we always recommend, pretty much for all horse farms, is to use the novel or endophyte friendly. And I won't get too much into species and all the you know, different um, products out there because Dr. Amanda Greb will be doing that in our next webinar. But tall fescue is fantastic um, as long as you get endophyte free or the novel endophyte. Uh, orchard grass is very productive, Kentucky bluegrass. So Tall fescue and orchard grass are clump grasses and they grow in big clumps and they're very productive. Bluegrass is a sod former and fills in those spaces. White clover, as you see in this picture, right? So we have all our grasses here and then you have white clover. Fantastic as a legume. It's higher in vitamins and minerals, higher in calcium, for instance. It also fixes nitrogen, meaning it takes nitrogen out of the atmosphere and holds it in the ground. And that way you don't have to put on as much nitrogen. The only problem is for horses, it can be a little too much for them. So we typically don't use more than maybe 20% of our entire pasture. You know, well, we don't want more than 20% of our entire pasture as white clover. Um, and, it, and it can take over. I look at white clover sometimes as a weed. So you got to keep that in check. But those are the typical species. Um, I, you can go to a store and you can pick a pasture mix. The one thing I would stay away from are pasture mixes that just have like 15 different things in them. You don't really need that. 
Uh, I'd also stay away from mixes with Timothy in them. Timothy is a fantastic hay. It, it's a great hay crop, but it does not compete well with fescue or even orchard grass or bluegrass. It just peters out and says, you guys win, take over, I'm dying off. So it's really a waste of money to put Timothy into a pasture mix. But certainly talk to you know, your agricultural specialist in the area about what types of grasses work well in your area with the soil type that you have. Another thing that you can do to really maximize your pastures is mowing. Mowing is just such an amazing, uh, just simple act that helps put grasses on the same playing field with the weeds, right? So we'll talk about weeds in a second, but this is actually some pictures of our rotational grazing site. Here's before we had the fencing up and this is after. So here we had horses grazing over here and they grazed to about three or four inches and then we plop them onto a new field. We come back in here and mow. The reason why is they eat the grasses, but they leave the weeds. And then there are weeds that grow up, they go to seed, they disperse their seed, and then they spread all over your pasture. So we don't want that to happen. So we, we need to mow, you know, somewhere between four and six inches to prevent weeds from going to seed. The other thing is the weeds will come up and some are very big and billowy and they'll shade the grass underneath and they outcompete the grass by pretty much not letting them see the sunlight. Um, so we need to go ahead and take those leaves off and really just give the grass equal footing to compete with weeds. And mowing is fantastic for that. I, actually, I can see here in this picture, if you can see these little darker clumps, that, that's, um, those are bathroom areas where they've urinated and I can tell that that field actually needs some nitrogen because this, you know, these are more um, areas with more nitrogen in them from the urea. But uh, mowing is great. So mowing is number one as far as controlling weeds. And we don't go too low, by the way. We don't usually go below four or six inches because you don't want to affect the growth centers of those plants. So as far as weeds go, it, weeds are tricky, right? Oh my gosh, weeds grow all year round. So trying to control weeds is a year round process. Weeds in general, if they're not toxic, they're not that harmful. I mean, they do provide some nutrition. I have sampled many weeds and sent them to a nutrient analysis type lab and, you know, they've got crude protein in them. But you don't, a lot of times, um, know which ones are the toxic ones. And, and, you know, if you have questions on that, I can answer some of that. But they compete with grasses, they steal the light, they steal the nutrients, and they also take the moisture out of the field. So we got to get rid of them. They're also host for uh, insects and pathogens. They can be poisonous. Uh, they're just ugly, you know, when they grow up along your fence lines and they take over. And like I said, they're seasonal growers. Now, I, I would, again, love to spend a lot of time on weeds and how you kill them, but I'm just gonna give some basic tips here. So first of all, we need to go out in our fields every season because weeds grow seasonally. There are some that like to come in right after winter, you know, during the spring. There's some that thrive in the summer. So you have to go out there, walk your pasture, see what's out there. If um, one of the best ways that you can get rid of weeds is just enhance that soil fertility. Like I was saying, if you want to try to get rid of your buttercups and instead of spending money on expensive herbicides, try looking at your pH and raising your pH. The other thing is the more grass you have, like this area is very sensitive to weed encroachment here because we have a little bit of grass, but every time a horse takes a step and turns over that soil, there are thousands of weed seeds in that soil. And then that weed seed gets turned over to the sun and then it can grow in that area. So if you keep these, you know, bare soil type spots in your fields, you're just really asking for weeds to come in. Mowing is great, we talked about that. Um, and then choosing an herbicide, okay. So herbicides are kind of like the knockout punch. <laughs> you don't go to that right when you're going to battle with the weeds. A lot of times you have to adjust your management, you have to mow, you know, you can overseed in, in some soil areas. But if you need an herbicide, you definitely want to talk to somebody. You have to know what you have uh, out in your fields because you have to pick one that's effective against what you have. And then realize that if you kill off, let's say, all your clover, you just have a field of clover, if you kill off all the clover or even kill, kill off the toxic weeds, you've got to put something down in their place because if not, soil gets turned over and just more weeds grow. So you got to have a plan when you're using an herbicide for what you're going to put in afterwards. Managing manure is huge on a pasture. If you buy a new farm, 
you know, put up your fence, establish your pastures, put the horse out. Initially, 100% of that pasture is a grazing area. Well, over time, you've got horses, and here's the statistics. A 1,000-pound horse, on average, produces about 50 pounds of manure, on average, a day. It's about nine tons of manure a year that you have to manage. Well, in larger pastures, if they start creating your bathroom area or their bathroom areas, you know, you look out there and months later, 50% of that pasture is now a grazing area and 50% is just a bathroom area. And how unproductive is that, you know? So you got to manage those bathroom areas because they're just a weedy, tall mess. One of the ways we do it is by mowing, like we talked about. After you mow, you do drag around some manure through the mowing process, but getting a drag, an actual drag or a harrow is a fantastic way to break up the manure piles. So you get rid of the bathroom areas, you spread the manure all over the pasture. What is manure? Really, it's got nutrients in it. You know, it's got nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So it's a great organic nutrient source. So you spread it and then you let the rains come, really soak in that nutrients, and then you put your horses back on. So that's one thing I kind of forgot to mention. You don't want to spread manure when your horses are out on pasture. First of all, they're probably going to run around. But second of all, you know, it's just um, you need that time for the nutrients to really soak in with several heavy rains. The other thing that you've got to consider if you're going to harrow or drag and spread the, the manure around is make sure you have a good deworming program because Horses manure have a high concentration of parasite eggs if they aren't dewormed properly. So what you could in effect be doing is just spreading all of those parasite eggs around the pasture and then you turn the horses out and they're infecting themselves or reinfecting themselves with parasites. So really drag um, when you have a good deworming program. Others have said you should drag on a hot sunny day and then that those parasite eggs get exposed to the sun. I would love to say I believe in that, but I've talked to uh, parasitologists that say those little suckers will, you know, survive a lot more than just in sun. So I'd say have that good dewarming program. But breaking up those bathroom areas is a fantastic way to reclaim the majority of your pastures back. So let me give you an example too. If you're going to rest a pasture, let's say you've had some horses on it for a while and they've overgrazed it, or maybe they're getting close, go ahead and rest the pasture, pull the horses off. I would go ahead and take a um, take and mow that pasture down to four, to four inches. So you level the playing field, make all the grasses the same height as the weeds, and then go ahead and take your drag in. And that just is going to kind of give a kickstart that pasture into growing up and then allow it to graze to about six to eight inches before you graze it again. But it's a really good idea to harrow that manure that, that's on that pasture. All right, I think I've talked about <laughs> mowing and harrowing a lot. They're my two favorite things to do for pastures. Um, maintaining a low stocking rate is so, so, so important. Look at this picture up here. This is from my um, master's research days. Uh, we you know, needed to put eight geldings on a very small lot for, for research purposes. And you know, within what, three weeks probably, it was a dry lot, but that's actually what we needed. So it was okay. But the problem with this dry lot in a normal situation is they've got manure, you know, sitting here. Well, heavy rains come down, the manure picks up speed as it goes down the hill, the soil picks up seed, and it's just not a good, it's just bad for the stream that's down here at the end of this paddock. Well, that's because we had too many horses on a small property. So this field actually is only five acres, it looks bigger, and look at the amount of horses we have out on here. But the secret is, we did not keep them out on that pasture every day, all day. We can't continuously graze, right? So if you don't have enough space, you have to manage your pastures better. The ideal stocking density or stocking rate is uh, one to two acres per horse. Um, but if you have to put a lot of horses on a smaller acreage and you still wanna maintain grass, that means they have to be turned out for half a day. Or if you have uh, horses that are overweight, apply a grazing muzzle because that will reduce how much they can take in. So you just, you're going to have to change your management if you don't have the acres. And by far, one of the best things that I, I would really recommend you try if you can, now not every operation can do this, but a rotational grazing system is really great for your pastures. So what this involves, and these are pictures from our rotational grazing site at Maryland, we have a loafing lot here. This is where they all hang out. These are our geldings. They hang out, they eat hay. They had a couple different hay feeders that we were trying out. They have a water source and they have a shelter. And this area is open, open to them at all times. And then we have a gate system here where they can come out and go out on different pastures. 
and this is just a view of it from the outside. So they graze as a herd when the grass is tall and productive and the weather's good. And then when the weather's bad, like if it's raining or if it's snowing, or if it's we're in a drought and there's just not enough grass out here, they have to come in here. So the gate would be closed here and they just hang out in here until the weather got better and we would feed them hay. So rotational grazing seems really hard because there's a lot of things that you have to think about and layout and where does the water go and all the internal fencing, like this is all electric. But once you get it down, it's so, so easy to do. The horses actually stand at the gate. They know, they're like, are we going out on the, this pasture over here? It looks like it's regrown and rested. And you're like, yeah, actually you are going out on that pasture today. So very easy to do. The key though to rotational grazing, and if you can't rotationally graze, what you can do is adopt these two essential rules of grazing. Number one, never graze lower than three inches. The reason why is when you have your horses graze lower than three inches, you're now damaging the growth centers of the plant. Those are really in the two inch and below range or even really three inches and below. That's where the plant has its growth centers. So if they're chewing that up, they're not gonna be able to regrow. The other thing is um, resting is really, really, whoops, I'm very sorry, just had something fall. Resting is really important um, when you have plants they need to rest and regrow. So in this picture, we're showing about eight inches of, of regrowth, at least if you can get to six inches of regrowth. And one of the reasons why is that what you can't see is under the soil, this, the roots are really, really sensitive to overgrazing. So, you know, here we see a very nice tall rested grass and underneath the soil is a pretty dense, you know, long set of healthy roots. Well, this is when you graze in short bouts and then you have long rest periods. Well, if you come in and you have long grazing periods and little, little bits of rest, you don't have the healthy plant that you do on the top of the soil, but you also have these roots that can become shorter and less dense. And then with continuous grazing where you never allow the plants to rest, you get you know not a lot of grass growth on top and not a lot of root health. And really you get to the point where the horses just rip it out of the ground or the plant just dies. So we need to rest and allow regrowth before we graze horses. So how does that work in this whole system? I have my little schematic here. The horses are in the loafing lot. When the weather's good and there's plenty of grass and pasture one, we've gone out and we measured it at six inches. They go out there and you know, they might be out there for a week. And then we go out and we're like, mm, getting pretty close to three inches. I think we better move them. We go over to pasture two. Pasture two has now regrown up to six to eight inches. So we go ahead and move them over. And I should say, I need to get my schematic a little better. You open up the gate between the loafing lot and pasture one, and then they're there. they don't actually go across the fence line, but you know, bear with me. So these guys now have this gate open and they're in pasture two. And then we go out there and we say, oh, well, they've grazed it down to three inches, but pasture three is not ready. Well, they got to go on the sacrifice lot or the loafing lot, and we're going to give them hay and make sure they have water and shelter and all that. And then, oh no, now it's raining for a couple of days. We're going to keep them in the loafing lot. And then eventually, you know, hopefully they get back out. The other thing I love about rotational grazing, or at least using the loafing lot, is that when you need to get out and apply fertilizer, apply lime, or even mow, the horses can be in the loafing lot and they can just kind of get out of your way and let you manage that pasture. Key to this is though, you know, it is seasonally dependent. So if you're resting pasture one after they graze it in the spring and the fall when grass is growing fast, you might only have to, you know, rest it a couple weeks before you regraze it. However, in the drought conditions, you might be waiting three to four weeks to rest that pasture before you can regraze it. So, you know, in this demonstration, I've only got three pasture paddocks you might need to have six on your property. That way you can mo move them through the system and allow that first pasture to rest and then the second pasture to rest before you regraze it again. Loafing lots are, to me, one of the most beneficial things that horse operations can do, even if they continuously graze. These are areas, and I, I interchange the word sacrifice lot. Reason being is we sacrifice this area. We know we're not gonna have a lot of grass in this area. That way we can preserve our larger pastures that are out back there. So loafing lots, we usually allow about 600 square feet per horse to give them enough space, you know, for movement. 
It should be all weather footing. In this particular case, this is our rotational grazing site. It has what we call a heavy use pad. So the land has been excavated down to the ground. We have a layer of landscape fabric. And then actually we have three layers of stone here, a larger stone that was compacted, a medium layer stone compacted. And then on top here, you can see our blue stone that was compacted. It should have a you know, hay feeder uh, shelter and, and water source. But these are fantastic areas to use when you're resting your pastures, when you're renovating them, or if it's just too wet and muddy, just pull them off, feed them the hay. Um, you know, they do pretty well. The only thing I would say about this particular type of heavy use pad, it's very tough on the joints. So for these geldings that were retired, also for our brood mares, it's fine. If you have a really expensive, you know, show jumper venter, I might use a softer footing for those types of horses. But it's great because you can preserve those larger pastures. All right, I really quickly wanted to give you guys some results from a study that um, Nicole Fiorlino and myself and our collaborators there did in 2014, uh, where we went out to horse farms and we wanted to know what are they doing in Maryland? What kind of best management practices are, are, they, are they looking or are they actually doing? So we went up to 51 farms and I wanted to show you that the farms were quite different. The average number of horses on the farms was 17 horses, but it ranged you know, between two and 72 horses. Acres, about 25 acres, which I was actually surprised by because the, the numbers, the data usually suggest about 10 acres per farm in Maryland. And that acreage ranged from one and a half acres, which some might argue, if, was that a farm or not, <laughs> to 135 acres. Stocking density, about 1.7 acres per horse, which I thought was actually pretty good, but it, it did range from 0.33 acres up to five. So our, our farms are pretty different. And I'm just gonna get right into the results. We looked at erosion on the farm and we found that in 81% of the pastures that we went into, there was erosion, right? And you can tell here, here's a fence line, here's your fence up here and horses have gone back and forth, probably they're fed along that fence line and they have eroded it down several feet. And that's, that soil moving is not good you know, for the environment. And it ranged from sheet erosion to large gullies. Um, let me bring up this picture here, there we go. But what we found was it wasn't inside the pastures really where the grazing area was, it was around the heavy use areas, right? So the gates, the run and sheds, the fence lines, um, the hay feeders, those are the areas that we really need to focus on and try to reduce erosion on horse farms. Now this is a lot of data that I probably won't be able to get through all of this, but these are best management practices for the whole farm that we were looking to see what did they, what were they doing and what weren't they doing. So the left column here is what they were doing pretty well, you know, between 96 to 75 percent of people were using, oops, were using these best management practices. And these are the ones that they weren't using very much of. But I'll just kind of quickly go through these. So keeping a buffer, a vegetative buffer between stream beds and where the horses were, they were very good at. 70 percent, um, sorry, 92 percent of the farms maintained a good vegetative cover. 92% of the farms were trying to reduce runoff from heavy use areas by having a vegetative buffer between their loafing lots and their water sources. A good amount, 82%, did have about 100 feet between heavy use areas and surface waters. A lot of this is the surface water type stuff. Horses were restricted from surface water, about 75%, and then stream banks with vegetation. But here are some ones over here that they weren't doing so hot at. Um, you know, 63% grass height was above three inches, but we had a lot of farms that had overgrazed pastures. Um, not everybody kept their horses separated from pasture or surface water. Here, loafing lots used. Only about 38% used a loafing lot when it, it's so good at protecting your grasses during the wet weather and the droughts. A lot of people weren't trying to correct the soil erosion. It was just getting worse. Not a lot of people used roof runoff to keep water managed on a farm. And then not everybody used those compacted materials in heavy use areas uh, like we would like. And then a couple more BMPs here, stick with me. About 63% of the horse farm operators were using mowing, so that was good. Only about 57% of the soil or the horse farm operators did soil samples and tested every one to three years. 43% applied lime. Look at this, only 21% of our horse farms that we visited were rotationally grazing. And then a number that wasn't that surprising, because I've done some other mail surveys, not very many, many of you guys are the horse farm operators use an herbicide. 
And I think a lot of that's cost. A lot of it is concern for the environment. Um, and it's frankly difficult. I mean, you have to go figure out what you have and match it up to the herbicide and what it's effective against. But what I like is soil testing, you know, and mowing. Those are your two big BMPs along with um, harrowing, I think, that help. Uh, also, we looked at soil nutrients, like were these farms really high in phosphorus? We were concerned about that. And it turns out not that, not that many were. So out of the soil tests we did, only one farm was low in phosphorus, 30 were medium, you know, 18 were in the optimum range, only two were excessive for phosphorus. We did have, uh, you know, 10 that were excessive for potassium, but that's not typically a nutrient we worry about as much as say nitrogen and phosphorus when it goes into the waterways. This was interesting when we looked at pH, nine did have low pHs, but for the most part, most of our farms had a pretty basic pH, which was fantastic. We were really glad about that. Um, okay, so this last thing was very interesting. We had a statistician work with us to develop a prediction model where it predicted the risk of soil erosion based on farm use. That was the only um, predictor I think that was, that was significant. So recreational farms, you know, those are pleasure farms, uh, the private farms that just ride their own horses. They were the least likely to have soil erosion on their farm. Boarding farms were 10 times more likely to have soil erosion than recreational farms. And then our breeding farms were 34 times more likely to have erosion than recreational farms. And you know, a lot of people, when they hear that are like, what? What do you, how is that even possible? Because, you know, I see those pictures of the broodmares and foals and these gorgeous pastures, you know, running around, and that's true. But if you think about breeding farms, those stallion paddocks get used every day. There's a lot of soil erosion around those fence lines and the waters and the gates. You have horses shipped in and boarding for a very short amount of times, either foal or um, be bred. And those are really heavily used paddocks that are located by the barn. So there were a lot of um, very heavily eroded paddocks by the barns, the breeding farms, um, breeding barns, excuse me. So the, the other thing is we really cautioned, that was a small sample size, only 51 farms. So, you know, you may not find that to happen everywhere, certainly. So it's hard to extrapolate out that to the whole horse industry, but um, just something to think about. So my key points for today, hopefully I've convinced you that unmanaged grazing horses really can negatively impact the environment. So getting a productive pasture takes management and also preserving the environment takes some management on your part. Using those best management practices can lead to productive pastures. And really, again, you know, they're fantastic for horses, great for our budgets, really, by utilizing pasture instead of feeding hay and, you know, using bedding and stalls. And it's good for the environment. So I wanted to leave you with a couple of resources and Jen's gonna actually cover these as well. There, um, we now have our U UMD Extension Maryland Horses website that has a fantastic list of resources, even those that uh, we've helped develop with the Maryland Department of Agriculture um, on the horse outreach work group. So check out that website. The UMD Horse Extension YouTube channel now has a lot of webinars and different videos that you can look at including this webinar series. And then Maryland residents um, or non-Maryland residents, if you can check out your local county educators or your county agents, a lot of them are ag agents and can come to your farm and help identify toxic weeds and you know, tell you whether you should just renovate your pastures or completely start over. And then our soil conservation, conservation district planners are excellent resources that can also help you um, with lots of you know, addressing soil erosion on your farm, getting your your pastures to be productive. So you have help, you don't have to do it alone. Um, and with that, I wanna say thank you very much for your attention today. That picture is from, I had a very stressful day <laughs> and I went up to our rotational grazing site and I just couldn't resist, you know, getting down, laying on that beautiful pasture. And I thought it would be kind of fun to take a little picture up towards that electric fence there. But um, I hope you all have very productive pastures and I would love to answer some questions. Jen, do you think you could ask me some questions that they had? I do have a question. We had one from, uh, from earlier um, discussing the grass varieties. Which grass or is there a grass that is best for insulin resistant horses or easy keepers? Do you wanna talk a little bit about grass varieties? Right, yeah. So 
When you have a hard, uh, excuse me, when you have an easy keeper or a horse that's prone to being overweight or prone to laminitis, the key is reducing intake and reducing the amount of non-structural carbohydrates they take in. So non-structural carbohydrates is just a fancy uh, word for sugar and starches. And um, so if you're looking at specific species, your cool season grasses tend to be high in non-structural carbohydrates because they collect um, their energy in the form of fructan. Um, so what we typically recommend is a warm season grass, but it's hard to grow. But one of the types of grasses we grow here for about three months only is Bermuda grass. So um, I do have some experience with Bermuda grass and if you ever want to send me an email, my email's down there, I can tell you the varieties that grow well here and over winter well here because winter is pretty brutal to Bermuda grass. The other option is using a cool season grass that's not very productive. So we have tried research into turf grasses that are very low growing and they really take a beating with hooves, but we just haven't found one to recommend to anyone yet. So you can utilize, um, you know, uh, grasses and, and tall fescue orchard grass and just mow them. Also keeping muzzles on your horses, I think is very, very helpful. I know horses don't necessarily appreciate muzzles, but they do limit intake. You know, in horses, it's been shown to limit intake somewhere in the 40% range and up in ponies, even more than that. So it can curb their enthusiasm for uh, cool season grasses. So I don't really have a magic answer, but Bermuda grass would be something you could try in the warmer seasons. I had a question of asking, can you recommend soil labs that give recommendations for amendments? I did put a link in the chat to the university's um, page through the MDA of soil test labs. Um, mm -hmm. that lists all of the, the various labs. And usually um, you just have to ask on your, when you submit your soil test, you check off what sort of test you'd like and which specific things you are specifically looking for. So hopefully that helps with that. But if there's more to that question, please let us know in the chat if you needed something other than just a list of labs that you could contact for soil testing. Um, we did have another question asking about good warm season grasses. I think you just mentioned Bermuda grass as a good warm season grass. Right, so Bermuda grass is one. I'm trying to think of some other ones. We actually tried to do research on crabgrass. Um, I think I'm the only person in the world who can't get crabgrass to grow for research purposes. But you know, crabgrass is very, very hardy and it does provide nutrition. It anchors soil. Um, it's, it's odd to think that you'd want crabgrass to grow, but if you have an obese horse that really doesn't need to eat a lot, you could try that. Um, what other warm season? It's really tough because we're in an area here, we get really down in the temps quite often and, and warm season grasses don't do well. What you could do though is also order some warm season hay from the south. If you have a horse that you don't want to um, be eating a lot of sugars and starches, you could order say Bermuda grass and have it shipped up and feed it to them in a, a sacrifice lot or a loafing lot. What other questions do we have, Jen? Uh, this is a question saying, we are in the mountains where we get very cold at night. It is my understanding that grass load with sh grass load with sugar when it's frosty, so we struggle with letting the grass grow longer to avoid sugary short grass and then getting too many weeds from yeah. not keeping the grass short enough. Any ideas or suggestions? Oh, that that is so tough. Um, okay, so in general. It was believed, and it still could happen, that those short vegetative grasses are high in sugars and starches, and I thought that as well. I actually planned a pretty large research study with um, um, some collaborators at Rutgers, where we had horses continuously grazing, and those that are on taller pastures that were rota rotationally grazing, and we took nutritional samples, and wouldn't you know it, that those pastures did not differ in sugar and starches between the two, as far as, you know, continuously grazed and short and vegetative and then the longer high fiber uh, type grasses. But what you did mention was correct in that as the sunlight shows or goes, or it's exposing, wow, I'm just messing that up. As the day progresses, the more sunlight that's on grass, the higher the sugar starch content. And it keeps creeping up till about, I think, eight o'clock at night. And then you start to see it decline. 
So if you want to graze animals and try not to have them eat as much non-structural carbohydrates, the theory is you put them out at night, say at 10 o'clock, you graze them through the night and then you bring them in to a loafing lot with hay the next day. The problem is, is even though it's a low percent and it's gone down overnight, they still can just eat so much that as a total, they're still going to overeat. So it's tough when you have animals that are overweight or prone to laminitis. It's just, it's just that they may not be able to go out on pasture. So I always hate to say that, but uh, it's a tough, tough gamble to try to figure out the, the you know, sun exposure and whether carbs are high or not. So you're saying though, just to clarify that it has more to do with the exposure during the day, the sun exposure during the day versus the length of grass in terms of the sugar content. That is my experience, yes. And, um, you know, there's only been our one research study, so certainly you could find it, and that was in New Jersey. So you could, you know, maybe in Maryland, it's a different situation. You know, there's some studies that the Virginia Tech ran, which is pretty close to us, where they show that the non-structural carbohydrate rate, or excuse me, percentage was so high in April and, and almost in May too, that they wouldn't even recommend grazing animals in that particular month of April. But that again was specific to them. So I just, I think you have to be very cautious um, when you're grazing any sort of obese animal or, or laminitic prone animal on pasture. Our next question is, is it better to drag smaller grass paddocks that only hold one to three horses or ponies or to keep up with mucking those, picking up the manure? If you can muck it, <laughs> that is excellent for parasites and keeping them from reinfecting you know, themselves and each other. The, it depends on the size too. The idea with the manure being used as a nutrient is it reduces your fertilizer costs. If you do leave some manure on that paddock and harrow it, you need to have somewhere to move the horses for a good length of time. So once, you know, let's say they graze it down to three inches, you move them off, you harrow, um, because you want to leave the manure on to be a nutrient source. I think you could do that. And then other times if you remove the manure, that's great too. So I don't, I don't see, you know, it being bad either way. Okay. We have another question about perennial ryegrass. What about perennial ryegrass? <laughs> oh, typically we stay away from perennial ryegrass. It, it's not necessarily the hardiest, but it also a lot of times has the highest non-structural carbohydrate levels. It, uh, you know, we looked at doing perennial ryegrass for our turf grass studies and just time and time again, it came back and it was just too high in non-structural carbohydrates. Uh, sometimes I've noticed where there is some ryegrass in the pasture mixes, but typically it doesn't last. Um, usually bluegrass and tall fescue and the orchard grasses tend to do better. Um, so that's just some considerations. Anything else? Yeah, the last question, question that I have right now is, um, when renovating my pastures with Max Q, the volunteer bluegrass was super happy in the beginning. <laughs> now it has yellowed out and is dying in mass. Thoughts? Oh no. Um, I'm surprised. So, I, you know, that would be a great question for me to pass along to our uh, pasture specialist, Dr. Greb. So bluegrass is an interesting one, right? So I've seeded it and it doesn't come up at all. It comes up two years later. And I always say bluegrass is late to the party. But what I've noticed is that it, it does take a beating in the summers. It's not very drought tolerant and maybe that's it. I don't know if it turned yellow and died off because of the summer heat. Um, gosh, I don't know. I, I just find certain bluegrass species here, not species, but cultivars um, also don't do well here. Um, I'm struggling. Maybe if you could come back next week for our forage um, species webinar with Dr. Greb, I think she could probably add to that conversation. The bluegrass is tough. I love it because it's sod forming, but I also find it to be a difficult one to keep around um, or just to bring into the party. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Dr. Burke before we wrap up? I don't see anything else coming in. All right. 
Well, you can always send me an email, um, but thank you so much for your attention today. I really appreciate it. I'll turn it back over to Jen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burke. That concludes our webinar for today. We hope that everyone has learned something valuable, something that you can take back and use on your farm or a farm that you may hope to have in the future and hope that we were able to answer the questions that you did have today. If you'd like to learn more about upcoming webinars, please follow us on our Facebook page, Equine Studies at the University of Maryland. If you like watching webinars at your own time from any location, we have several of them now posted to our University of Maryland Horse Extension YouTube channel. Please check those out, subscribe to the channel so that you can be notified every time a new video is posted. All of the webinars from this series are posted in their own playlist. And we have a couple of other playlists specifically um, relating to soil fertility, and establishing pastures that you might find useful if, if you're um, looking for that kind of information. So again, make sure you check out all of the resources. We have lots of printed publications also available in the resources tab on our website, extension.umd.edu slash horses. So visit us there too. And of course, we're always available to help answer questions anytime during the year if you may have those. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you all have a great day and look forward to seeing you next week.